Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to Bible study, Center Reach Bible Church. Let's look to the Lord in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you, Lord, that we can gather here, Lord. We can learn your word, Lord. We can learn the things um, that are important to you, Lord. And we pray, Lord, that we our hearts and minds will be open to uh, doing what you would have us do, Lord, that we would be faithful servants, Lord. We'd have to be faithful in all things. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning I'd like to look, we're going to look at some very familiar verses um, through the Gospels mostly, and basically to find out a little different perspective on some of the Gospels and on Jesus' uh, life when he was here on earth, on his ministry, and how he went about that. Some things that um, lately I've had a I read a book, uh, which I found very good. There was a, a different perspective on things about how Jesus planned and um, carried out his ministry here on earth. Some things that might be a little surprising. So start off with, um, let's start with the next thing. And the title is, What's Important to Jesus? And Jesus doesn't make any secret about this. He tells us what he thinks is important and what's uh, of concern to him, and then we're going to find out a lot of the reasoning behind it, too. So what's important to Jesus? Um, and specifically, what does Jesus think is most important? What does he say explicitly is most important? And this, of course, is a very familiar verse. Um, Matthew twenty-two thirty-six to 40. Teacher, what is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and prophets. So this um, response, you know, this question was by a Pharisee who was representing a group of uh, Jewish leaders who were, you know, trying to trap Jesus as they did a lot, you know, trying to catch him in something that they could use against him. And here they were looking for Jesus to take a certain viewpoint that they could dispute. And rabbis at that time, a lot of times they would dispute on what's the most important law or is this law more important than that law. And so they were hoping Jesus would give some answer that they could say, hey, that's not as important as this law. You know, So they were trying to get him into an argument. But uh, Jesus was... His answer was indisputable. I mean, who could dispute that you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your soul? I mean, this was from the Shema, you know, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, um, you know, something that every Jew, this would be utmost in their minds. So there's no question about that. Um, the thing is, interesting though, he had took these two commandments, they were from different places, different books of the uh, of the uh, law of Moses, and in different contexts. There were, you know, one was, like I said, the Shema was the first one. The second was from Leviticus 19.18, which talked about Jews getting along basically with other Jews. He was talking about fellow Jews, their neighbors. And um, so, in Jesus as combining these two laws from different parts of the uh, books of Moses, um, they give it a different context. And Jesus did this a lot. He interpreted things in the law which people thought they knew. And Jesus told them an interpretation which was, in a lot of cases, shocking to them. You know, one, of course, that um, they should love their enemies um, and that kind of thing. And that, um, you know, like adultery is even having lust for a woman in your heart is committing adultery. These are things that people didn't see that way at the time. And Jesus um, interpreted these things um, in a manner that was not their common interpretation of the rabbis and the leaders of the Jews at that time, of course. So, <clears throat> so what's the significance of these two commands being inseparable? And when we think about what they mean, um, is it can you love the Lord, Lord, Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and at the same time, not love your neighbor as yourself? You know, does is, is that seem plausible when we think about it? And now it seems 
that's, I mean, God loves everybody. He loves people that are sinners. He loves everyone. And that's why he came to die on the cross. It was his love for mankind, for all people, whether they had repented at that point or not. And again, is it possible to really, on the other hand, um, love your neighbor in the kind of love that God has, an agape love, um, without loving God? In other words, if you don't have God's love in you, can you love your neighbor in that way? We can all love somebody that's dear to us in a romantic way, uh, love somebody in a brotherhood kind of way, but can we love them even when they're our enemies, really, when they're doing things that are directly against us? And we certainly see that happening in our society now. There are people that are uh, very opposed to Christianity, just every in principle, and they've made themselves our enemies. And we really love them without God's love. So you can see really why these are inseparable. And I do want to focus a little bit on, um, I'd like to actually everybody turn to Leviticus 19.18. And while you're, um, while you're going there, I cheated. I put a bookmark in, but because I want to get this in context a little bit and see really how that law was presented originally. Because Jesus did have somebody come to him, a um, lawyer, they called me, was some, really somebody that was an expert in the law of Moses. Um, you think of a lawyer now as a civil lawyer or a criminal lawyer. But this lawyer was a law, he studied the law of Moses and he was an expert in it. And we do have this guy come along and ask Jesus about this. He repeats these same commands. And he must have heard Jesus say them because he repeated them together. And then he asked Jesus about them. And asked specifically, as we'll see, who is my neighbor? So I want to actually, verse, uh, chapter 19, start with verse 17 to get a little bit of the context of what this uh, command was. It says, you should not hate your fellow countrymen in your heart. You may certainly rebuke your neighbor, but you are not to incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance nor hold any grudge against the sons of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. It's a, Leviticus, Leviticus 19, 18 is the, um, the verse I really am talking about, but I want to get it in context, so I started with 17. And see that this command really does sound like, and even the verses before 17 really makes it pretty clear that he's talking about fellow Jews, and um, you know these are the people that are your neighbors. And of course, Jesus expanded that, as we can see, in Luke 10, 29, 37. This is after this expert in the law repeated these things and asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? And he said it, as we see, and starting in Luke 10, verse 29, but wishing to justify himself, he said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied and said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among robbers. And they stripped him and beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. And by chance, a priest was going down on that road. And when he saw him, he passed on the other side. Likewise, also a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed on the other side. But a Samaritan, who was on a journey, came upon him. And when he saw him, he felt compassion. And he came to him and bandaged up his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them. And he put him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. On the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him. And whatever more you spend, when I return, I will repay you. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell in the robber's hands? And he said, the one who showed mercy to him, Lord him. And Jesus said, go and do the same. Again, a very familiar verse, um, but very important. Um, did, Jesus included the Samaritan, and um, by implication, really, all Gentiles too, people that were not um, of the house of Israel, people that were not what the Jewish people thought of as their neighbors, but Jesus included the Samaritan. In. And Samaritans were enemies of the Jews, and they had been ever since um, the division of the kingdom after uh, David and Solomon's um, United Kingdom, they were divided. 
they fought wars against each other. And then eventually, of course, the Northern Kingdom was conquered by the Assyrians. The Assyrians uh, exiled a lot of the people and at the same time brought in Assyrians to live with the Jews that were still there. You know, they took the leaders, exiled them, and then with the other people brought in these Assyrians. And as a result of that, they were they intermarried, they were mixed. The Jews from Judea, from Judah, decided, you know, didn't consider them real Jews anymore. So they were almost, in a lot of ways, worse than the Gentiles. Plus, they um, started to practice syncretism. Not that Judah was perfect either, but syncretism is when they mixed um, pagan religions in with the worship of the God. And sometimes they got to the point where they didn't even distinguish between where they worshiping God or were they worshiping some, worshiping some pagan God. Um, so the people were, the Samaritans were despicable in the eyes of the Jews. The Levites and the priests, of course, they were considered um, chosen by God for a special, you know, for priesthood. This was a special thing. The Levites and the, among them the priests. Um, and they probably thought that they were pretty righteous because of their, how they were, because they were born into the priesthood or they're born in at least as Levites. And this was a very special thing. So they thought they were pretty in there with God, you know, right up there. And uh, they also probably thought when they came across this um, injured person that, gee, you know, they, what important to them was maintaining the ritual purity. And if they touch this person, they just thought that would make them unclean. They'd, there's no, we don't know who this person was. This was just a person that we don't know if he was Jew or Samaritan or another Gentile. But they wouldn't want to get involved. They probably thought they had more important things to do because they were very important. They were, you know, Samaritans or they were, I mean, they were um, Levites or priests. Anyway, the bottom line is they could not be inconvenienced um, to bother to take care of this person. They didn't have compassion on it. And so Jesus, um, you know, told them that this was, you know, that the only person justified in doing this was the Samaritan who they despised. So it's easy to kind of look at this situation and say, boy, how could they be that way? You know, these you know, people, they just, you know, turn the other way. They're just too self-involved to be bothered with this, you know. But, but I think a lot of times when we look at our own lives in our, in our situation, and sometimes we maybe we're not too willing to go out of our way for somebody that we don't know that's maybe not a believer, and especially if it's somebody you know, that we think maybe is uh, opposed to Christianity, as they probably thought the Samaritans were opposed to Judaism. Um, somebody that's, you know, maybe a communist or Muslim or somebody that's woke, <laughs> um, even worse, that these people are opposed to Christianity and are really going to go out of their way to do something, to really reach out to them. Or are we not going to bother? Because we do have, you know, we have things of our own to do and to take care of. And of course, you know, life is busy and life is complicated and we might not you know really put ourselves out that much so we need to look at that because the important people now there's not there are poor people around us to be sure um, but there are people who are completely lost who don't know Jesus who are um, destined to relate to to hell people that will not um, you know be that if somebody doesn't reach out to them if they did you know Jesus came to save everybody, but if they don't hear about Jesus and nobody is willing to tell them, they might not know, and you know they won't know. They, how can they know if nobody tells them? You know, like uh, Philip with the uh, eunuch that he met on the street. Uh, it was in the carriage. If he, if nobody explained to him the scriptures, you know, how would he know? So, this is something we need to look at very closely, um, and something that's very important now to us and to Jesus. I, I really do believe that this is very important to Jesus, and we're going to see explicitly why it is um, as we go on. So one thing we need to do is we need to pray um, for evangelism to increase. We need to pray for people that are um, unsaved, but we also need to pray that the Lord would put it on our hearts enough that we would be willing to go out of our way and willing to um, sacrifice our time and our convenience and everything else to reach out to people who don't know him. 
And we can see that Jesus had this kind of compassion that we see in uh, Matthew 9, 36 to 38. Jesus is seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. So he's not saying pray for everybody in the world that's not saved. I mean, that's something that um, you can pray generally for that. It's not wrong, but specifically what is needed is people harvesters, people that would go out there, bring the word of God to people that don't know him. And, and this is what he means by these workers or these harvesters, workers for the Lord who are doing this to bring the word of God to people that don't know it. So when he's saying beseech the Lord of the harvest, of course, he's saying to pray to God for this. Because God is the Lord of the harvest, so... And again, to receive an excerpt from um, the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6, 9b to 10. Our Father who, is art in, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So this prayer for God's kingdom to come on earth is certainly something we look forward to. Uh, a lot of times, you know, we see the, the way the world is going. We see the unrighteousness. We see things like that. And we certainly want things to be right. We want God's kingdom to come. But we need to realize at the same time that if it comes like right now, it's going to be very, very hard. If we, you know, rapture comes and people that are left here, it's going to be very difficult for people to be saved at that point. It's much better that somebody reach out to them at this point before that time comes. And the time is getting short. So um, we need to see this. We want to see this happen quickly. And of course, you know, to see this happening quickly, we really should be participants in this to, to help bring it about. So, um, and Paul also, when he was um, preaching through Asia Minor and he had um, preached to in Thessalonica and the people received him quickly, you know, and it was, uh, he was making very good progress and very fast. And he says to the Thessalonians um, in Second Thessalonians 3.1, he says, finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord will spread rapidly and be glorified, just as it did with you also. So even there in Paul's ministry, which by our uh, estimation is going at lightning speed as far as spreading the gospel, he went from, you know, all through Asia Minor, a lot of places there in Greece, um, eventually even Rome, and spread the gospel to thousands upon thousands of people. And... So it was moving very fast then. Um, and there had been times in our past too, where the gospel was uh, rapidly, there were people coming to the Lord in rapid uh, succession. You know, and a lot of times there was um, the Jesus revolution, the one thing, and probably not too many of you were alive at that time in the uh, 70s, in the early 70s. Remember they had the, all the hippies, and this started in California too. Um, in fact, there's a movie about it, you know, the, uh, the Jesus Revolution. It's kind of an interesting movie because it, it follows this guy who ended up being a uh, pastor in a church that became one of the a mega church, but I, I think a good mega church anyway. Um, and also this weird hippie that became uh, a Jesus freak, as they ever called him those times. Um, and he was a freak. <laughs> this guy was, he was out there, you know. But, uh, <laughs> so, uh, but there was a big movement and there was a lot of people that, um, coming to the Lord at that point. And that was when I actually um, came to the Lord first. I was at that time in that environment. That was a big thing. Even And prior to that, even in the 19th century, it started in New York City of all places. There was a church there and a pastor who was preaching and it became a big movement. It, it was, became very widespread for a good part of the country. And these things, you know, I, we can't, see exactly how they happen. We can't see how God works um, through his, um, you know, from, uh, through his working of things, making things work out, you know, his providence. Um, but God does these things. And it starts with people that um, the Holy Spirit comes into their hearts. They become excited about it. And it was at that time, I remember when we first came to the Lord, it was very exciting. And uh, we were just, we were caught up in it so much. So 
that um, the things, you know, normal fears we might have about going out in the street evangelizing, which is a scary thing. It's a scary thing then too, but there were a lot of weirdos there, so it wasn't quite so bad, but um, there weren't people opposed so much to Christianity as there are now. Um, but we did that, and it wasn't a matter of um, people going out on their own. It was a matter of the people were all together, and we were um, working on this together, and brought, and when people came in, uh, people were open to discipling them at that time. And it's, it's a very important part of a movement like that, that dis people disciple other people, and so that those people in turn would become part of this and bring other people in. And that's the only way that the church will even really grow in the long run. You know, we can, there was a lot of things where a lot of people were brought into the church and if they're not um, taught and if they're not discipled to that point, a lot of times it just withers away. So it's a very important that these people that are brought in are trained and, and taught about scripture and taught the word and taught about Jesus' love and shown it by the way the people in the church are acting, that um, their sincerity and that they're not as other people are. You know, they're not um, bickering, they're not uh, carrying on, they're not looking out for themselves, but they're really looking out for doing what God wants them to do. And that's really the way it needs to be for the church to grow in a sustained way. And unfortunately, we've seen lately it has not been happening lately. We've been losing a lot of people, and uh, it needs to be turned around. And only God, of course, can do that, but he does it as he chose to do it through his people doing this work for him, spreading the word. And we're going to see even during Jesus' ministry how important this was to him. So, yeah, looking at Jesus' ministry on earth, catch up to my notes here okay so his jesus um method of evangelism might surprise us a little bit you you think like when jesus was on earth he would try and maximize his exposure to the world and show everybody everything about him and get as many people as he possibly could uh, to come to him before he went to the cross. But there was, he had a different um, approach to this, and I never have looked at it this way before. But of utmost importance to him were his disciples, because he realized he was going to go to the cross, die on the cross, be risen, and be with the Father. And who was going to carry this work on? Who was going to bring this to the world. The first people that were doing this were his disciples. You know, of course, there were, you know, several thousand people, at, you know, that did follow him, but some of them followed him, you know, not necessarily to the point that after when he died, certainly when he was crucified, people scattered. When he had told them certain things, um, in John chapter six, I didn't put this on here, but 65 and 66, that a lot of people left him because what he said, seemed like a hard thing to them about, you know, giving up of themselves. So a lot of people left him, but it was very important to him for his disciples to know him and know what, who he was and what he stood for and see him and to live closely with him. And that's, that's how they learned is by living with him um, so that they would be able to carry this on. And we see in the book of Acts that especially Peter and John in the beginning, um, Thousands of people came because of their testimony, because they were there with Jesus, learned from Jesus, became very close to him and understood who he was and what he was there for. And they became very much a part of it. It took some doing. You know, of course, they also had their, they were human and they made a lot of mistakes. Um, a lot of them wanted to be first, you know, a lot of them wanted to... Uh, um, you know, be the center of attention there, or to be up with Jesus on the right hand of the Father. They wanted, to, and a lot of them uh, were, you know, like even Peter, one of the, you know, inner, inner core, if you were, the, the three that were the closest, um, Peter, James, and John. Even Peter denied him when he was, you know, brought before the people, and he was outside, Peter was outside, and uh, denied Jesus three times. So they, it took a lot. It took a lot. These were 
um, ordinary people. They were not learned people. They were not uh, uh, biblical scholars, if you would think of, you know, the, like the priests and the scribes and the Pharisees and those people. They didn't have that kind of learning. They probably went to synagogue. They knew the basics of uh, the law of Moses and the prophets, um, but not experts in it by any means. But what they did have, they had a heart that was open to Jesus and to his ministry and to his word. And these people learned from him. And sometimes if you know too much, you can't learn too much. You know, if you were like, like the Pharisees were, you know, you, you figure you know it all, you can't learn. You have to really have to be somebody that doesn't think they know it all. And that's what these people were. They were fishermen, tax collectors, people who are not considered the people that are knowledgeable in the Lord. So they were receptive to learn from Jesus, to learn about Jesus, and really be a part of him. So you see in the very beginning of his ministry, um, the first when he first started out his ministry, after John the Baptist was, uh, or John the Baptizer, whatever you want to say, um, was baptizing people, and Jesus was there, and people came to him. And this is right in the first chapter of John, John 35 to 40, we see um, people... Jesus actually bringing these people in, these disciples, the first ones. And it said again, the next day, John was standing with two of his disciples. And he looked at Jesus as he walked and said, behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. And Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, what do you see? They said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, come and you will see. And they came and they saw where he was staying. And they stayed with him that day, for it was about the 10th hour. And one of the two who heard John speak follow him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. And Simon Peter, uh, I mean, Andrew brought Simon Peter in like that very same day. And the next day, um, let me find my spot here again. So he was, uh, Philip and Nathaniel brought in the next day and probably we're not, it's kind of hard to follow the chronology exactly, but within Jesus' first year of his ministry, he had the 12 disciples, you know, with him and was training them at that point. And he not only taught them um, intellectually, he uh, imparted his spirit with them, to them. So, of course, there was intellectual learning, but there was also his spirit, which was shared with them, and so they had the spirit of them through all their, you know, mishaps and stuff that was growing within them as they were, the more they were with Jesus. And they were with him pretty much all the time. He had times, of course, where he took them aside and things that he wouldn't share with um, the general public, he shared with them. Um, last month, you probably don't remember, but we learned a, uh, a parable about Jesus in the uh, field where the um, enemy had brought in um, tares in the field, which was Darnell. And he gave the uh, parable to everybody, but he brought his disciples aside and explained it to them. And he said to them that, you know, it, to you it has been given to know these things and not to everybody else. And even um, at one point, you know, during his, after his transfiguration, which was really long with John James and Peter, yeah, Peter, John, James, that uh, he told them to tell nobody about this. So there were certain things that he wanted his disciples to see and to experience and to know, but he didn't want it just spread out all over the general public. And, you know, the general public at that point, um, well, he knew, he knew what he was doing. Um, I don't know, I won't answer why he did all this because I just don't know exactly, but it was important that he, the disciples learned and knew this but not important for the, all the masses to do it. You know, you think somebody wants to make a name for himself. Shouldn't he like show them all the evidence of him being who he is to everybody? But he didn't do it that way. And so his strategy was, was different than you might think, you know. Um, and you could see this throughout, the, uh, throughout his whole ministry on earth, that there were things that he kept from other people. But he you know, use these things to teach his disciples. And uh, I, most of this I got from this book, The Master 
um, The Master Plan of Evangelism by Robert Coleman. It was written back in the 60s. And there's some things from the 60s that are a little different, but it, it goes through all the things about Jesus' ministry with a, a lot of scripture references. It's a small book. It's only like $7 if you buy it new. And you get it at, um, what's that, bargain bookstore, huh? Thrift books, yeah, that you can get it. Seven dollars shipping included. <laughs> it's uh, Robert E. Coleman, C O L E M A N. Yes, Pastor. You know what I'm thinking about on just pondering why Jesus said that a lot. He would say, "Don't tell anybody who did this. I healed you. Don't tell anybody." And I think it's uh, what was that? Yeah, and they they always went and told that anybody, everybody, anywhere. So Jesus knew that, but uh, it was a picture of his humility. It was a picture of he didn't have to brag on who he was or uh, come, you know what? The word alone will stand. And today people evangelize, and I see a lot of people evangelizing dead church, not Jesus Christ. You got to come to my church. It's, it's all about selling their church instead of selling Jesus Christ and what his word says. So I, I don't know, maybe loosely that's what he was doing, you know. Even though he was the central focus, the word and God's plan was the central focus. And you know, we're not selling some new religion, we're selling truth. I hate to use the word selling, but we're presenting truth. Right. And we don't have to, you know, Jesus could have just made everybody believe on God, this is the way it is. But he was very calm and quiet, but he knew the word alone would change hearts. So that's what he Right. Yes, thank you. Also, I think in setting the right piece of example, so you know, a lot of them say, don't tell anybody what you did. But it's hard on his part because he knew that, that if the certain people in power found out what he was doing, he would have shut his ministry down early. You know? And yeah. he knew he would be mobbed and he wouldn't have all these people to go out there and expose themselves to little groups that he could have easily. Right. Yeah, I remember when his uh, he was going to go to um, Passover, his family was going, trying to encourage him to go to the Passover, and he said, no, I'm not going to do it. He went, but he went secretly, yeah. So he did have to have some, yeah, you know, had to be wise in that manner to uh, avoid it. You're right, yeah. Yeah, I remember that, too. And it's funny, though, because, it, you know, in this book, too, this, in the 60s, apparently there was a lot of evangelism going on. And it was like a very widespread, scattered thing that a lot of people were hearing about it. And it, it seemed like good, but it wasn't sustainable in a way, too. And that was another thing that he wanted it to be something that would carry on because he knew he was going to be on Earth a short period of time. He knew that for people to benefit from his sacrifice, people had to hear the word of God. And he knew that it had to be over a long term. So it had to be something that was... Uh, the roots were put down for this to be continued over years after he was gone, and it certainly certainly did work, that's for sure. So we see, like, like I said, in the very beginning, he uh, called his disciples right in the beginning of his ministry. And um, I, I, as I pointed out before, um, in Matthew 17, 9, as they were coming down from the mountain after his Transfiguration, Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. Um, and like we said, they didn't always listen to him, but uh, he did tell them. Okay. So at one point um, in their learning, Jesus had to send them out. It was an important part of their learning is to be able to go out on their own and spread the word of, about Jesus to the people around them. And he sent them out in pairs. You probably remember that from um, Mark 6, 7. It says he summoned the 12 and began to send them out in pairs and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. Um, they had certain things different than we would have today. They had basically speaking to the people of Israel. So the people of Israel, he didn't send them to the Gentiles, he sent them to the house of Israel. Um, those people did have a, an understanding to a point, like I said, of the uh, law of Moses and the prophets. So they had some common ground there, made that easier. 
He gave them power over unclean spirits. He gave them power to heal. Um, and these things were part of what he, the tools that he gave them, uh, in a sense, to be able to uh, go out and spread the word about him as he was doing it in another place. So um, he did that at that time. Uh, we don't have some of those experiences. We don't have those types of things. But we do have, what we do have is an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And we do have, as we're going to see, we have Jesus with us through that spirit. Um, and it is through God, is God, through the Holy Spirit, it will cause changes of heart. So it's not like we're going out there on our own or empty or without support. We're going um, with, with God with us. And God is the one that's going to do the, make the change in people's hearts. So we don't need to be afraid of uh, being a failure because it won't be a failure. Any questions, comments at this time? Yes. To be prepared for it, you mean? Yeah. Well, basically, um, being prepared for it, the primary thing you need to know is the Word of God. Yeah, and you need to, and your heart has to be in it. In other words, you need to, for one thing, um, have the Spirit, as we talked about before, the Spirit of God within you, and to love God with your whole heart, mind, and soul, and to have a love and a burden for those people you're going out to, to see. And I think that's very important. And I think, um, you know, if you're just forcing yourself to do this because you feel it's a duty, you know, that's a handicap. You really need to have, and that's why you need to start with prayer because you really you need to pray for the people you're going to see that their hearts would be prepared for you. But you also need to pray for your own heart and that if you don't have that type of burden for the people that you're going to see, you really need to pray about that too and, and to make sure that you are, um, your heart is right with that. And with that in mind, with those two you know, most important commandments and a knowledge of scripture, um, then those are the primary things you need. There are some other things that um, I'm probably going to next month about being prepared to talk to people now. People have all kinds of strange ideas nowadays. And sometimes you have to speak to them in a way that you, you listen to them crazy as some things that they might uh, believe are, it's important to be able to listen to them, give them their respect so that they will listen to you and to try and really understand if they had things holding them back from believing that uh, you would be able to address those things. But you can't address them without really listening to what they're saying and trying, trying to discern what they really is holding them back, uh, which isn't always easy. Yeah, that, yeah, that. It's like I was telling Charlene, the whole thing of ministry, and what I know is in Corinthians, um, it's uh, a gift of him, give us, it's um, you know, 9, 16, 16, Corinthians, we just said that you have to do it not grudgingly, you have to do it lovingly, and it's all happening. It's just, you know, it's going to be for a reason. Right. <laughs> oh, good, thank you. It, yes, ma'am. Yeah. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Good. Anybody else? Okay. So. So just before Jesus left, before well, before he went to the cross, actually. Um, he was preparing his disciples. He actually was closer with his disciples at that point uh, than through what seems through some of the middle part of his ministry. He <clears throat> rather, again, than focus on getting crowds in at the last second, he was focusing on preparing his disciples for what was to come. And of course, part of that preparation was the helper, as we talked about, the Holy Spirit. And we see in John 15, 26 to 27, he says, When the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, that is the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify about me, 
and you will also testify also because you have been with me from the beginning. So the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, will testify to people about God. And these disciples who have been with him from close to the beginning of his ministry will also testify. So he is, you know, their hearts at this point are prepared by having been with Jesus, by taking of his spirit and his knowledge that they can testify personally about him. And that was a big thing. And, uh, you know, again, remember, um, it's almost, it is a testimony about God and about Jesus that really is kind of uh, part of this apologetics that what about these people that were with Jesus and people would say they deny the resurrection or something? How and why would these people be so enthused to the point where they would tell the leaders, you can tell us not to talk about Jesus, but we can't help it. We're going to talk about it. And that's how much they were um, in touch with Jesus and with the Holy Spirit, that they, there was no option for them. They were going to talk about God, and they were going to talk about Jesus, and they were going to talk about it regardless of what these, how these leaders of the country were threatening them. So, what's that? Yeah, exactly, right. And they, right to the point of dying, they didn't ever deny it. And so they always spoke of it because, like they said, they, they weren't going to listen. They couldn't listen to the to the leaders at all. And again, in John sixteen seventy eight through eight, it says, "But I tell you the truth: it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I did not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And he, when he comes, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment." So they didn't have the burden of having to convict people of sin. And sometimes that's, I mean, that's such a good thing because you try and convict somebody of their sin and you're going to end up in a fight. <laughs> but if the Holy Spirit is convicting them of their sin, then it's really convicting them without you being confrontational. You know, you point things out that, you know, that are right and wrong, but you don't need to, to um, directly uh, you know, attack somebody because of their sin. Okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very much. I don't remember what verse I used last month, but about you know talking, listen, be quick to listen, slow to uh, answer, and and do it in a very kind and loving manner. Right. It's important. Right. And let God do the rest. So, so that's um, that's a, again a very good and important promise that He gave them. And then in, um, in John 17, 19 to 21, and here Jesus is praying to the Father for his disciples and for us as well, as we see. It says, for their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they themselves also may be sanctified in truth. I do not ask on behalf of those al these alone, but for those who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. So this is really a, um, puts it together in a way, what Jesus expected of them and how he expected that to work and that they, people that would learn about him through them would come to believe. And of course, that, as we were saying, goes on to the, those people that they disciple would in turn disciple other people and the church would continue to grow. And as we saw it did, continue to grow throughout the world. And Jesus knew this was gonna, this was the way it needed to be done and the way he had planned it right from the beginning. So Jesus um, does give us a command and again, a very familiar verse. I'm sure everybody knows this verse, these verses here. Um, Matthew 28, 18 to 20, Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven on an earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I command you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So this is uh, very familiar, but some things I want to point out that are not 
always, we don't always see um, that might be overlooked or you don't emphasize them in the verse is that um, <clears throat> things we need to keep in mind when we're reaching out to people that don't know Jesus. Um, we need to act humbly as he taught by his actions as he was on earth, but we need to remember that his authority, what his authority is, that he, all authority has been given to him on heaven and on earth. And although we're, we should be meek about it and we should be uh, kind about the way we present things, we never should compromise that. We need to present Jesus as having the authority over heaven and earth as been given to him by the Father. And the other thing to remember is that Jesus is always here with us too, as we had um, touched on this before, that, um, you know, when we're talking about convicting, but also that Jesus is with us to strengthen and empower us to do these things, that we don't have to feel like we're on our own and that uh, we need to be fearful of the world because we know that Jesus is with us and Jesus strengthens us and will give us what we need when we go out to, in the world. And again, in Philippians 4.13, it says, I can all do all things through him who strengthens me. All things. And also when we go out, we don't need to feel like we need to be the beginning and the end necessarily of bringing somebody to the Lord. We may get a chance to just speak to somebody shortly and not be able to follow up all the time. Or somebody else might have spoken to somebody and then they have an interest. And then to bring them to discipleship, there are other stages of that. And all these things are important parts of it. We see this kind of, um, Paul mentions this in, in passing uh, about, you know, he would bring the word as he was doing through um, a lot of people. He and the people with him, Apollos and um, Barnabas and those, would bring people to the Lord, but not necessarily doing it all himself. We see in 1 Corinthians 3, 5 to 6, and then what then is Apollos and what is Paul? servants through whom you believed, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. So again, what we need to do, we need to be faithful to, uh, to God and to Jesus and to, to uh, be there to spread his word and to give his word um, with all our hearts, but we don't need to feel like it's all on us because so, it's on, we are you know, part of God's army, and each person doesn't do everything himself. Yes, Pastor. It's not consistent, like the uh, last the nail in that portion of the teaching, in a good way. You know, it, obviously, we're at the end of days, and a lot of people are saying they're backing off from us, and we're like, ah, it's all going to be what it's going to be, so it doesn't really matter. But it's interesting, Jesus, when asked about when it's the end of the age, one of the things he says in Matthew 24, uh, as crucial, in verse 14, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. You, you know, if you want to be, what was that? Yeah, no, that's, yeah, that's, yeah. Know you know, it's, it's like, you want the end, you want Jesus to return? It's, it's possible. I think he says, if we can hasten his coming, we actually can. By doing what we're supposed to be doing, we should be evangelizing like never before. Is that's the whole key? Is we should be preaching to everyone, not saying, "Well, it's, I'm just going to sit back and uh, post marshmallows because it's almost over and I'm out of here." It's the complete opposite. That's right. what I see happening. All right. Yeah, me too. Anybody else? Okay. Let's lift the Lord in a word of prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you for uh, for your presence. We thank you, Lord, that you uh, haven't abandoned us, Lord, that you were there with us. We thank you for your wisdom, Lord, in um, using your disciples to spread your word. We pray, Lord, that you would use us too, Lord, that you would um, make our hearts right about loving you and also about loving our neighbor, Lord. And then you would um, lead us in opportunities to spread your word, to spread your love to those around us, Lord, that we, might, that we might bring them in, Lord, that we might care for them, that we might bring them to full discipleship. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.